Yeah, hi everyone. So we're doing this quick conversation, or at least a lengthy one, because um, I wanted to sort of present Veza and um, just his thoughts on the digital art space, also just having a very casual conversation, um, more or less like an introduction from his lens, because he's been in digital art as an artist for a very long time. He's seen the history of it, the transitions. Um, also, he has his opinions on what, where it's going and ideally where he wants it to be. And I just feel from people who are maybe looking at this from an entry level or interested in collecting digital art or, or just this, the knowledge of the subject matter, um, I think it will be interesting to have someone like Vez's take, Vez's, Vez's take on um, the things that um, are really important in this space, uh, just because of the wealth of knowledge he's been in it for such a long time. Um, also, we're, we're sort of working closely in sharing his art, uh, which he has various types, and I'm sure he will also discuss that as well. So yeah, Veza, I, I hope that was a, a sort of quick intro, um, but I don't know how you feel about maybe giving a bit, yeah, an intro on yourself, and maybe we can take the discussion from there. Very cool, and super nice to be having another conversation with you, Raul. It's, uh, it, it always leaves me quite inspired because how we got to know of one another and our collaboration thus far uh, is well, I'm convinced that you're doing this for the um, for the underlying reasons as to why this is important and an evolution beyond the noise and uh, it's been every time quite fun that we've connected and I'm sure this one is going to be one of those sessions too and we get to record it so that's cool um, I'll, I'll start with something that because digital art and let's say crypto art, there's a what makes it a little bit complicated to it feels a little complicated to understand. There's a couple of things, and uh, one thing that is kind of under, important to understand what Bitcoin is uh, to begin with. And once you get the hang of that a little bit, then it's very easy to kind of understand the value argument of of digital art or crypto art altogether. And I'll, I'll take you back just a little bit in terms of what's intuitive and counterintuitive about this whole thing is that what's intuitive is that we all kind of live on our phones uh, a lot of the time. We're in a sense in a metaverse already. We just have a pretty bad user experience of it with the device of how we're doing it, but that keeps evolving all the time. But also the last uh, decades, let's say five, six decades of computers have left most of us feeling like computers are very good at replicating things and very good at sharing things. So if you think of it in terms of value, it's kind of like trying to make the sand in Dubai to be the money. It's, it's not going to be very easy for people to intuitively understand why digital art would have value. Yeah. And this is where Bitcoin comes into the picture um, because there's only 21 million of those coins and I think about 7 million of those coins have already been lost in different defunct hard drives and, and sent to wrong addresses and whatever, all those different kinds of things. And once you understand that there is finally a system of digital scarcity and through the system and others like it, you can make a digital file that is essentially a digital artwork or a replication or a picture even of a real life painting that then gets tokenized in this in this way. There's a variety of different kinds of ways. But if you follow the steps correctly, what it means is that you will have something, even if it's only a digital file, that can be um, authenticated and perceived to be as rare as the Mona Lisa in the Louvre. Mm -hmm. And this is the counterintuitive thing to grasp about digital art that all of a sudden after decades and decades we have a technology that stops this being only about replication and distribution and that being super easy. All of a sudden you would have a one of one of something or one of ten of something that is that can be a drum beat, it can be a book, it can be uh, a lot of different things. I mean, there, there was that famous thing that Wu-Tang Clan uh, just did a one CD and that only one CD was ever sold, uh, even though it's a mass distributed device. Uh, still, it was utilized and produced in such a way that only that Martin Shkreli or whoever that uh, AIDS drug guy was that got to buy it for, you know, quite a lot of money. Uh, so, in this, this kind of a way, all of a sudden, our digital lives, which are, like I said, already increasingly digital, 
get to have a monetary value and the produced data, because this is also something that I've dwelled into quite deeply because I work with Brittany Kaiser, the famous Cambridge Analytica whistleblower and data activist. Uh, it was already, I think it was Bloomberg that said in 2017 or 18 or something like that, where uh, it, they, they stated that data is now the most valuable asset in the world. And we, because we have been in the Web2 realm, which means that, you know, Facebook has been got, getting all the value from the produced data that all of us produce, what Web3 really means is data ownership and, and these different kinds of methods of how we can um, control what we want to put out there that others are utilizing and whether it has a price on it and, and these kinds of things. So maybe that all packages it together as to how we're very early to this thing um, and very few people understand it. And then there's, of course, a lot of motivations for different people to try and muddy the water so that you wouldn't get it uh, because they want to get in there first and do do their thing. Um, there's all, the, all different kinds of things, but that at least gives a little bit of the map of where we are and why some of the early crypto art is going to be perceived uh, to be valuable as time goes along. Because that's one of the things that I also liked about how you started talking when we first got into this whole thing is that I'm looking for the collectors who have a slightly longer view than the quarterly fashion flipping uh, type situation is that, you know, if you get the right artwork, that's generational wealth. Uh, and there, there's such a wide range of different artists who are producing uh, art. Um, some of them are really aiming at the new renaissance eternal type works and and supreme value and some of them are just quick flip whatever meme coin type style meme something that is here today gone tomorrow type type situation and often what i've what i now especially feel like is that many people they're not aware of the the high quality stuff that is going on they're they're much more aware of the um all the what would you more be like meme coins or or something like that and that's not the whole of the space there's many opportunities here and there's absolutely amazing quality visionary artists who are doing their thing and um, hopefully the conversations are like ours are going to find their way into the sort of uh, in front of the people who are the serious collectors who are looking for opportunity who are looking to uh, understand what this evolution is and why it's important yeah, I mean, how how should someone determine value with respect to digital art? And why I say that's like, because for example, we've had these discussions where you see in the auction houses or the resale secondary markets, like the cartoons selling for very high prices, no? Um, mm. So if you take sort of that financial element out of the equation, or uh, what do you see? Like, what's a way to process and think about it? in terms of determining value, um, especially because like, I think it's such a, um, it's a new category of art. So there's no way to like have data from how it, you know, certain art pieces or artists perform. So I'm not sure if you could shed some light into that. Well, I, I can, I can maybe talk about a little bit of how it is that I'm, I'm trying to solve the puzzle because, yeah. you know, a, a, I would say a relative amount of art is subjective. So that makes it somewhat difficult, but there are metrics that you can use in order to um, have some sort of a, again, I suppose I like the word map in front of you and how to go about it. And I think in art in general, if you go all the way back to cave paintings or religious art, uh, how mosques and churches started to um, utilize the power of art to communicate stories and, and uh, describe transcendence and awe and th this kind of thing. Uh, that's one part of what I've tried to do with my art is to try and get to the point of describing something that would be existing in the where there's no time and space. Something that is is part of that eternal power that is inherent in right uh, in art when you're when you're doing it right. Then there's the the other stuff and that would be commenting upon maybe something that is going on in the crypto market or something that is going on in gen general in culture. I mean, we're, we're in no shortage, uh, for example, in the end season of America at the moment of how many topics there are that, you know, are, are an endless wealth of things. But perhaps 
And the risk of when you're doing the cultural stuff uh, is a little bit of how short-lived it is. Because at the moment, uh, for example, you know, I, it, it feels like it was only yesterday, for example, that there was, whether you like him or not or whatever is irrelevant, uh, the, the Trump assassination was something that uh, really... Or, or his the attempted assassination was something that captured the whole world, and it felt like all, almost in two three weeks it was gone. Something that uh, just a while ago in in our global culture would have maybe taken a long time to process and and those kinds of things. Now we're in this eternal news cycle and and all these kinds of things, and that's where the that that's more the meme coin uh, type situation. But if if you or an artist who manages to make a reputation in that, that you're constantly on that wave of, of doing all of those things, then that, that's one thing. And if, then it's, of course, your network, your reputation, your innovation, uh, your process. Uh, and in one thing, uh, for example, that I'm, I'm quite proud of having, I feel like I've achieved as an artist, is my own perspective, my own language, and my own sort of signature and by signature, I don't mean a signature as in, uh, I mean that when those people who know of me, they see my artworks, they immediately know that it is me. And that's one of the most difficult things to achieve as an artist is to have your own, uh, I suppose, uh, a voice. And I try to do it in such a way that, for example, this piece that is behind me is, is done like this. But then if you scan it with your mobile phone, it'll come to life in a in a digital way and then I started working with a bunch of different metaverse companies who started making digital spaces and digital galleries for me so I try to cover the whole of the range of things in order to have something for someone and then there's of course the philosophy side of it and what I try to represent and the values that I try to put into it uh, and in that sense I quite honestly haven't come across anyone who's doing it like I'm doing it at the moment uh, that's not to say that there aren't incredible, mind-blowing artists art out there who are doing uh, a variety of different kinds of things and using all different kinds of techniques. Uh, some of them in ordinals now are starting to be, for example, AI art made in such a way that it's a code that generates the picture, but what you're actually buying is the script of code, and there's a new niche market just around that AI code. Oh. And, and that said, I am also using AI and custom scripts in order to uh, do the things uh, now as well in my new census series, which is one thing that you're also representing. Uh, and uh, I work with celebrities like Brittany Kaiser. There's, there's this one Bollywood actress that I worked with and uh, now over 10 years ago called Veena Malik. And when we did what we did together, which... Uh, resulted in these digital originals again we reached about 300 million people already back then so uh, I've been around a while uh, yeah. and I've seen all different kinds of things and I, I, I just because it is so contentious for many people they they really don't see the value or that they think that the whole of the NFT market is nothing but garbage well while I don't think it is that I've done my very best to try and deliver the opposite of those arguments as into why you wouldn't be able to find value in this space. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this, I suppose, largely, just to come into a conclusion about it all, is the, because I, I came across the work of Ken Wilber uh, in my early 20s, who's considered to be the father of integral theory. Mm -hmm. And he, not of course personally, but through his audiobooks and books, taught me how to think in such a way that I have to look at one thing and slice it up and look at all the different kinds of perspectives and value arguments towards it from a multitude of perspectives. And if you can achieve that, then you have something that is quite steel -manned. And that's what I've tried to do with my art altogether. No, that's fantastic. I mean, it, it, especially because like your art form, it, it captures many different varieties, different segments. It's not just one narrow type. Like, as you mentioned, you're doing sort of the census series, you have your abstracts and um, how, how do you come to like these ideas? Because I think like observing certain artists, they kind of like pick one, one style and they stick to it. But you seem to like want to explore different topics. Like how do you decide, um, for example, you wanted to do the artisan series or the abstract or, or your crypto art as well? 
Um, well, it's this gets a little bit deep if I'm going to honestly actually answer that question. Yeah. Well, uh, why I'm particularly fascinated by a lot of different kinds of uh, religious texts and uh, origin stories, not only in cartoons, but but the the origin stories of humanities and uh, the the whole of humanity and the pyramids and and all of these uh, Vedic texts and whatever is that what I realized some time ago is that a lot of them have a, a let there be light type of situation or in the Finnish Kalevala the the mythology of of my my nation from from the earlier days was that it was an egg from which the universe was born and so to speak and we we live in a planet that is quite a traumatizing experience to many people and I certainly had my share of it as a kid and it took me a while to figure out even though there was this force that was coming through me that I had to find different tools and methods on how to express or 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 do things with um, it felt like there was a there was something going on that I really needed to understand of how this place works and and for a reason or another a lot of people feel like they are they're not really born through this world. They just sort of pop in here and then look at uh, the like Alan Watts said that they they sort of feel like they're separate from from the world. And what these origin stories of the world, what they tend to represent, is that there's an origin creation uh, story of this world, and this whole world is creation uh, in one way or another, it's in this eternal process of, of being born and dying and being born again. And, and, and so to speak. And uh, if you look at it accurately, everything is in spirit all the time and in this reemergence. And if you're just connected to it as a person, you're, you're never out of inspiration. You're never out of topics. You're never, because you're connected to everything that is, and if you have enough mastery of your tools of how to represent all the different things, you can make an artwork of uh, like that. Like one of uh, one of the early crypto artists, Tom, uh, he made he he makes, for example, these banknote uh, artworks where he uh, it, it's the style of banknotes of how he draws different things, and because Trump for example, is such a polarizing character, he made a banknote image of Trump being shot in the ear. Mm. So uh, it, it, it's what he's doing is a special kind of technique and then he's taking a culturally relevant topic that you're especially not as an artist meant to be inspired by and then he puts it out there into the market. So it, it, that's his way of, of doing things. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's... I've since I figured things out, and uh, you know, for me, psychedelics played a part. Um, actual spiritual practice played a part. Whatever was given to me as a natural talent for this, as well as going uh, over whatever you know trauma is even possible for humans to to kind of how how wholesome you can make yourself. All that together has made me into something that, uh, you know, inspiration is never a problem. No, it's great. Because, yeah, it's noticeable. Like, I think sort of the way you have different points of attack on each act, act degree. And um, actually what's intriguing to me and for anyone who's sort of interested in Vez's artwork is that you use your talents of film and storytelling, especially with the crypto art. So, like, the way I wanted to tell, like, people, like, if you go to Vez's website, um, you'll find all the sort of art forms and especially the crypto ones, videos. I found the stories are really well done, like the way you narrate it. And I think that's obviously from the experience you had before. Um, so I think that's just something I, I thought that, yeah, definitely share out there. So for anyone who wants to, to dive more into the crypto art, which I think I'm not, let me not put words in your mouth, but it seems to me that's where you have a lot of um, passion and stories to tell. Or would there be, or are the other art forms equally as like art for you personally? Well, there's there's something that uh, it, it, there's a couple of points to it. Uh, I mean, uh, the grand story I think in crypto art or this Web three evolution altogether, what's really important about it and why I think it's 
something that is worth paying attention to is that our anyone with any perception knows that our global culture is in in a crisis state, and people talk about World War Three and and all, all everything of tradition is being uprooted and upended, and everything is in, is in this slightly miasmic, strange kind of feeling, a little bit of what's going on with us, and um, you know all number of different kinds of problems. And and if I take a moment in history that is relevant to art, that is a little bit similar, especially through the innovation of Bitcoin, was the Renaissance Italy before it became Renaissance Italy, because it was the Medici family with their monetary innovation that they did uh, and then their particular attitude uh, because Italy was in scatters uh, and there was all kinds of different crises going on at the and definitely Italy wasn't unified and 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 then this one family comes up with this innovation and then starts funding the best of culture the best of sciences and and kind of really believing that they can uh, make the spark of Italy come alive in a different kind of way of what it was. And they managed it. And now because they did, we go back after centuries and centuries to Italy to look at something like Michelangelo's Pieta and we wonder how it is possible that this 23-year-old is able to carve something that is, you know, there's no better word than divine when you look at that statue or many of the other things that were achieved in that era. And what sort of uh, now expanded out of Renaissance Italy is that we have the whole world that is in a similar situation now than Italy was. And through Bitcoin, and you'll know this if you hang out with Bitcoiners, they're very critical of where our education system is at, our politics is at, especially where the money creation process and who gets to control it and why is at, and many of these these problems. And essentially, you could equate that the decentralized and that's something that I'm looking for. If I'm looking for who I would consider to be a serious artist or someone who is investable, uh, I would be looking for a voice. And then it's not so important what it is a voice for in terms of looking at the cultural side of the value of whether they can go up and down. I have my own preferences, like I say, perhaps in the in the more eternal side of things. But I have a deep appreciation for something like uh, the commentary of Banksy or or whoever. It's just that my anchor is in something like Renaissance Italy and the grand masters of, of, of all time in art. And um, there's a lot of politics that is going on in art at the moment. Uh, but I find it that what calms me and how to do it so that it feels correct to me is that I have a perspective of thousands of years to it rather than something that is even decades now. So I think it was like something which was quite interesting in, in what you mentioned was like the history and culture aspect. And mm -hmm. actually with the digital art thing, which is also even more interesting, is like it's like a digital catalogue in the sense. So it's combining the two. And I think if mm -hmm. one can look at it from that perspective, that's where it's really interesting. So there was I, I, I was just thinking about it and it it's it just shows that there still needs to be like a lot of education and awareness in this space. And why I say that is like, I remember there was one, it was, I don't know how long ago, but when Jack Dorsey sold his like first tweet as an NFT or something, and it was very baffling for people, like how, like it was some crazy amount of money. But at the end, when you think about it, really what it is, it's like, I mean, whatever you think of the, you know, the circumstance of the individual, but it's like, capturing the history and culture and it's like what you mentioned i think art always has good art always has the ability to like tell the story of that period in time capture the history and the culture of that period of time and do it well um i think even for example with what you mentioned with the trump situation like i think people did some kind of a um, a painting towards that so i guess that's like what you're alluring to like as a collector, it's it's connecting with an artist who maybe resonates with you and the stories. It's kind of like you see the world in a similar lens. I'm not sure if, I'm, if that kind of makes sense or. Yeah, well, uh, Beeple, Beeple does this sort of social commentary, uh, maybe in line with Banksy a little bit or, or something like that. And it's intended not to be. Um, and. Uh, I, I don't think I'm talking out of school to say that it's not very 
deep in terms of its its exploration and its fun and it's very crypto in this kind of way that people really like it. But uh, my approach, for example, is something like if I made uh, one of the first artworks in crypto that I made was I am Satoshi Nakamoto. That was the name of it. And what I didn't mean, I, I didn't mean that I'm Satoshi, obviously. Uh, in the visual artwork itself, I spent quite a lot of time pondering about that thing because back then in 2017, everyone was asking constantly, who is Satoshi, who is Satoshi? And that was the great mystery. And I, su I suppose it still is, of course. But then it felt like much more tangible. It was up in the air that we really wanted to know who this person was. And it's sort of faded a little bit. But I, I tried to think of how to present it. And there's this sort of hacker in a hoodie that, uh, and the face is transparent. There, there's, and behind the face, you start to see a lot of different faces all across the world from all different races and genders, wh whatever, all this kind of thing. And then all across the painting as well. So your first uh, impact of looking at the artwork is to see this hacker and you're wondering at the identity. Whereas the correct question what I realized was, how am I Satoshi Nakamoto using this technology? So this is why the painting actually embeds about 2,000 faces that are sort of in this hidden way on it. But if you spend a little bit of time with that artwork, you start to see all the faces emerge from it. And hopefully the idea was that you would get that the important question for you is, if we can trust the technology of how it is that you can be Satoshi. And what does, what does that have um, as, as a consequence to your life. So I try and do it this way. I try and ponder at great questions or important things about this whole thing of why it is that we're doing it to begin with. And, you know, there will be some who will prefer the Beeple stuff. And then there have been, uh, luckily, also some who've resonated with my way of doing it. And necess then necessarily to say which one is better is, is up to the collector or the viewer, really. And I think that sort of brings me to my second question I wanted to ask, like, in terms of your style, like, what would you categorize it as? And compared to, like, what the other art forms, sort of other digital art forms there are, like, how would you, how, what would your style be? And I think maybe if you could maybe give a bit of a, a, an insight into the other art types that you see at currently in the market, just so we have, like, we have a few... Um, names and you know descriptions and categories to go by okay um this will take a little bit of time to answer i'll try and capture it as best as i can sure. but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my background of how i ended up here is that um i started my creative efforts as a five-year-old turning my parents pots and pans into a drum kit and i started banging away and uh, first I was enthused about music and then went to film school um, because that's where I wanted to, as a, as a teen, I just wanted to be a rock star. I didn't even want to know the notes. It was more of a, uh, it, well, at least half an image project as well as the art project at that point. And then I evolved into something um, a little bit more serious, which was if in film school, I was in, as interested in the theory as I was in make, making films. Maybe not equally, but still it was an important part. I felt if I'm going to be a serious artist, I need to really have a, my, know my profession. So for the first decade of my, my adult life, I was a filmmaker and I made documentaries and television series and music videos and all this kind of stuff. And then I had a crisis of everything. I was paying my production company bills and I was not nowhere close to being Ridley Scott or David Fincher or something like that. And I got this crazy idea that what if I started body painting on people? and their bodies would give the correct proportions and I could play with paint and photograph uh, the body painting session as well as the, the paintings that I was making and combining it with Photoshop because I started using Photoshop in 1999 or something like that. So I felt very comfortable kind of just throwing it all in the mix. And I, I in 2008, when I made my first artwork like that, I realized that I had a digital original. I had to reproduce it to the the physical in order to make any money whatsoever. I had production company bills that were running uh, in the background. and I, I, But as soon as I saw this artwork in front of me, I realized that this is what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I didn't want to make films immediately after having seen this one artwork in front of me. And I kind of realized that I came up with my own process. Uh, and no one at the time, it feels like still, 
if you really look at the the depth of it and how how I started executing it, there's there's not really people who do it the way that I do it and put it all together. And how it evolved is that then this style started being only visual, only using paint or nature photography or these kinds of things. Then we started animating them to come to life. We produced a whole studio that was 360 in physical life, um, this fully immersive space as an experiment. We started putting the art on cars, animating those cars to come to life in the uh, NFT realm. Um, so digital, I suppose, is the word. I'm not a super fan of it, but it, it'll do for now. As in that crypto family is the new Medici family. It is the new monetary innovation. And it's the people who understand what the problems are. And hopefully also the community that will, through their innovative minds and resources, fund at least some of the solutions to the problems. And now we have the decentralized systems and centralized systems that are kind of, at the very least, competing with one another to keeping each other in check so that neither one gets to corrupt itself too far before they go off the deep end. And we didn't have anything like that almost since yesterday. And these are uh, why a lot of the early collectors and a lot of the early people who, are, who have been in this space and supporting some of the early people are risk takers. And, but they understood the profound problems as well as what the solutions are. And therefore, it's not only risk taking, it's also um, really seeing yeah. the opportunity of how, much, how far and fast you can rise some, with some, someone like Michael Saylor and what he's doing, for example. Because uh, like if Bitcoin goes where we think it's going to go and how much Bitcoin he's accumulated, these are essentially the new czars of the world. Not of countries, but the globe. So that's the kind of opportunity that we have in front of us. And of course, you know, when I saw this whole thing, not only was it something that got energized my life in a whole different kind of level and gave me a lot of opportunity to jump into crypto art, but understanding this, and I, I, I hope this doesn't sound too big headed, but, but it is accurate that, you know, sometimes people say that I'm, I'm one of the veterans of, of crypto art, but it was in January 2016 when I made a tweet that can be confirmed um, that I'm accepting Bitcoin for artworks. It took a while before anyone paid me. It's uh, actually towards the end of 2017 before anyone paid me in Bitcoin. But uh, through that whole thing, I, if crypto art was a company, I could say that I'm one of the co-founders of it. So I, I was here from the very early days when there was only very few of us here. And if you look at the history of many different kinds of art movements and where Cezanne and Picasso and all those kinds of people were hanging out, there was a very small community that ended up doing a lot of the most impactful and valuable work of that era that ended up in all the museums after the dust was settled. Yeah. So that's where I want to be, of course, and have done the work to deserve to that spot, potentially, but it's up to the community, of course. At the end, that's what it is. It's like you've cataloged from your lens in a very authentic way and the art form tells its story in that sense. And that's why I did. I, I would encourage people who are curious about crypto art um, to look at Vez's artwork and especially um, the videos are very insightful because they give you that narrative, that story to understand it in a deeper, in a deeper sense. So that's something I'll definitely recommend anyone who would want to to dive a bit deeper into that, like that sort of um, art. The one thing I did want to ask was like, what should people avoid in this space, in your opinion? Like, what, what should, yeah, what attitude should they not have, or what should they not collect, like as you see it? Well, in terms of the like, short wrong question to ask, is it like, what should just people sort of come to it with their own frame of mind and? And, I think uh, there will regardless. I mean, there, there's, uh, I, I've been, since the early days, I've looked at the whole evolution of the space, both in awe and horror uh, <laughs> of, of how, how little a lot of it went the way that I thought it was going to go and where people found their value and what they wanted to support and, and yeah. what was the thing. And I, I, I think if I'm doing myself in the space, the best of justice is that 
I'll just present my case and uh, help shine a light on some of the other people, uh, companies or artists, whoever, who I think are doing a great thing. And the rest is uh, up for other people to figure out why they're in it. I mean, I, I, I try to do it, like I said, from the Ken Wilber perspective of if you're looking for critical acclaim, you can find it. If you want to find major media articles from Forbes to BBC to whatever, you can find it. Uh, if you want to see a recognizable voice, you'll find it here. If you want to have the insight, you'll find it. Um, and credibility in a sense that I've been here seven plus years now, and that's verifiable. So I, I try and give as many value arguments as I think, but ultimately, you know, there could have been maybe someone who listened to me for the first five seconds of this interview, and the only reason they hung out the, this long is because they disliked me. And they would ever, never buy anything from me because that's just how what their intuition said from the, the first second or so. And then there will be the other ones who maybe had the reverse of that. And they saw me and listened to me for five seconds and they liked something about it. And then all the rest are just details that confirm the rest. And maybe they then uh, want to participate in, in one way or another. It's, it's an internal mystery. Like Terence McKenna said, the famous psychedelic bard is that, you know, the world is not a problem for us sociologists and psychologists to try and try and figure out it's an eternal mystery that we get to live in and participate in and be a be a part of and I'm um, I'm just very grateful that this space has given me um, as well as the headaches <laughs> a lot of opportunity and amazing experiences and and lots of friends yeah. and I'm, I'm in awe of how many bright people who are not only doing something that is very interesting intellectually or even spiritually if you want to go go that far to say it but 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 also they're doing the brave thing they're they're often the ones who are a little bit rebellious and defiant in the face of things that don't make sense to them and they have the courage to kind of break through cultural norms when it's necessary and it's I'm not a fan of being rebellious just for the sake of being rebellious I'm only rebellious when I see that something is wrong and then want to correct something and I don't mind taking the pressure or the heat if that's if I feel it's the, the right thing to do and I think this is what attracted yeah. has to have the meaning behind it yeah for sure for sure um, yeah I think for me obviously the one thing I did also wanted to touch base on, and, and you mentioned it slightly, was like, what needs to be done in the digital art space for it to, it to go in the direction you want it to go in? Um, and, and actually, what where do you see it now? Like, do you see it in a positive space? Do you see it like, um, yeah, just where, where, where do you see it now and where, where should it be, where should it go? And what what's required to get it there? Well, that's and and honestly, and not not blowing smoke your way too much, but but the reason for this conversation is one of the the things of what I really want to see in this space, which is that um, people want to have collectors who have a longer mindset and a more insightful mindset as to what they're collecting and why they're collecting it, and support the kind of people who are doing the substantial thing that is helping to have the real value arguments against those who are saying that this place is valueless or that it's only a bunch of scams or criminals or whatever it is that they say. Uh, and and that's, that's important. Education is important. Supporting those who are doing the real work of it is important. And, uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit as well. It's like what, what seemed a little funny to me is that because I know how some of the early scene went and why it went that had very little to do with the art itself. It had a lot of agendas, other agendas at, attached to it that were being able to pass because there wasn't a lot of legacy art world knowledge here. And then those artworks that were being pumped for not the reasons of art then end up in the first Christie's show of crypto art and NFTs in Dubai. And it's because all of a sudden then legacy systems were jumping on getting 
into this new money train, but they didn't understand what they were doing and they were just adopting to the playbook, then essentially <laughs> to what it looked like to me is that it was almost like Gordon Ramsay, um, like giving you a rushed Big Mac t type situation and asking you to take it seriously. So it's, been, it's hilariously comedic also what's been going on to a, to a certain degree here. And uh, it's just that art being quite subjective in many different ways does allow people to, to play a variety of different kinds of games that not necessarily has a lot to do with art. And in that, I'm just trusting that people will have the intuition and they, they'll need to do their homework. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it, if you are investing into serious art, then you need to take it as in seriously as you take any other investment. Um, if you just want to put some poker money into the table and go with uh, whatever it feels good to you and you only had a half an hour, then don't be too surprised if that goes to zero. That would be my, my right. sort of thing. And uh, yep. along with the, whatever, it's, I think you're doing the right thing and I really appreciate it. No, so I can see like the two main takeaways for anyone who wants to really get into the space of the collector's long-term mindset and determining value. And value meaning actually go for the beauty of the art, the rarity, the history and culture, like what what um, Vezer explained in detail, as well as community engagement of the artists, etc. So I think those are very two good key points that you've mentioned for people to bear in mind. Um, I think for me, just to obviously round off my questions, because I've sort of <laughs> given a lot of questions, is um, what are your plans this year with respect to your art? Like... Um, are you focused on the the stuff you've done before, or are you going to be? Are you doing new works? I mean, where where you are, where where are you with respect to that? Sure, I'll I'll just say one more thing to to the previous sort of thing before going into that, is that I also think that the legacy art world has a little bit to learn from how quickly some of the uh, works were flipped in terms of value and how quickly it rose and went down and all those kinds of things in terms of the dynamics of, of this space is that it's not only that you need to buy now something that then hold it for 30 years or I don't know 100 years or whatever it is in order to see the fruition of things if you find the value artists uh, you can still make money off them in a quick kind of way you might you know just buy something and sell something in a couple of months that you know just 20x your value and whatever and then you just keep your mind on the, that artist and keep supporting and going back and uh, and these kinds of things and those aren't as common in the legacy art world and i think that's something that they can learn from the crypto art world as well of how to invest into some of these things you can play a lot of games but it's just from my perspective it's great that if you play those games in such a way that those games are justifiable even to to certain degrees which is often hasn't been the case. But in terms of what I'm doing next, um, uh, the, the Brittany Kaiser project uh, is, is something, well, my, my son, uh, if God willing, is going to be born in two, two months. Uh, and that, that's uh, my most important project at the moment. But working with Brittany Kaiser, we're doing the post-production with Mercatura Forum in Egypt. That's, a, that's one thing. Uh, there's a bunch of different kinds of things, um, not wanting to... Um, kind of go deeper into a lot of things that I can't really talk about yet, but planned uh, collaborations with celebrities, keeping up with the census project that we're collaborating with, and how to grow that with a lot of different uh, social media people who have a, a wide range and reach, which, you know, uh, I don't necessarily have in my social media yet to, to that degree. But also, I have this concept called Renaissance 360. And it started with this experimental studio that we built, this whole 360 thing, as well as uh, all these immersive digital art uh, experiences and NFT value attached to the digital side of things. And I'm um, uh, slowly but surely putting together my own company called Vesa Digital. And we will uh, specialize in all of that as well as consultancy. Uh, because from the Web3 creative standpoint, I started doing consultancy for companies some time ago already. And that mainly happened because I realized that overnight, all of a sudden, there were so-called Web3 experts who came in with the worst worst advice on how to do this whole thing. So I just realized that I've been in this long time and I kind of am able to 
to do that better than some of the people who presented themselves as experts and then luckily started getting some clients as well. Uh, but that's uh, those are the kinds of things. Uh, putting together this Visa Digital Company, which is this digital and digital renaissance, is is a deep inspiration of mine. And I think the natural evolution where I need to go as an artist as well. Yeah. And for people to find that information, like, would it be art? vo.org or artofcrypto.com where would they go for that? Um, both of them I, I mean uh, artevo.org is the legacy of my body painting media art as well as this new census series yep. and then when you go more towards the renaissance 360 and crypto art and the last seven years then it's that website because they're they're in terms of worlds and what they present they're quite different in terms of their substance, and I still haven't really figured out how to bring those two worlds together in such a way that they would be under one website, uh, because both of them are rabbit holes that <laughs> should keep you entertained a while if you resonate with my art. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but also, do you mind if I if I flip the tables on you for just a just a few minutes? Sure. Uh, but just just in terms of like figuring out, because I, I I wanted to hear your story as well of why you wanted to put together Affluent CEO and what. What resonates with you about this whole journey and what, why, you, why you're inspired to do it? Yeah, sure. So I'll be honest, my, my start of the project was from a commercial lens. So I, I was doing marketing for a few crypto projects. I think that was in 2022. And um, obviously everything declined. But I saw the real value in creating quality information in that respective space. So I... Just that let me start, you know, writing and, and exploring that avenue. And one thing led to another. I mean, it started off as writing very different stuff or, or researching very different topics. But then I came across sort of the traditional art world. And um, that was great because, like, it was just something that was intriguing to me. It's like, you know, the art industry is obviously something that's kind of opaque. Like, there's information, but there's not information. So as a person who's just naturally mm -hmm. curious... Um, it has a lot of things to, to dive into. So I was writing a bit about that. I started to interview some people, luxury collectibles as well. But then I started to notice that the issue, at least to me, the way I see it with those type of industries was the, the physical aspect. That if I'm talking about something in one part of the world, an audience of mine in the other part of the world, like there's no, there's no connection to that. You know what I mean? So, like, if I'm talking about, like, Indian art or something, um, or an auction in Hong Kong, like, and I have a U.S.-based audience, I didn't see much, you know, that could be done there. But I came across, obviously, the NFT and digital art space. I mean, I knew that this was part of the thing which was interesting. I knew about NFTs, but I didn't know about the digital art, and I didn't know it in the way we're discussing it. Because, like everyone else, you just go, in 2021, this hype, um, a lot of weird stuff being sold for like, you know, outrageous prices. And you're like, how does this, I mean, how does this work? So I remember through research, learning, obviously talking with people, um, getting a good understanding of this space. And then obviously as you process it, you're like, man, this has so much scope. At least for me, the way I see it, it's number one. The digital what, what was the first thing that hit you? What, what was the first thing, really, thing that really hit you when you went like, oh, this is serious. I got to look at this different. When you could see that it has all the benefits of art without the limitations that traditional art has. Um, mm. So you have a robust secondary market. You know, you can just go into OpenSea or whatever. You can buy trade art. I think the value... For me, what, how I looked at it was that, well, actually, what's actually the, the, I think the most fascinating thing with this is that I could be in one location of the world and I could support an artist who I love who's based somewhere, you know, completely different. And also beyond that, it's like when you look at it from like, um, what would be the word? I guess a society standpoint, like, you can support artists and artworks where there might not be even an infrastructure. Like, let's say the art world in Europe or the States or wherever. I mean, those, those areas, are, it's, it's quite sophisticated. I mean, it's quite developed. 
but there might be other parts mm. of the world where there are artists, but there's no sort of galleries or, you know, there's no infrastructure. Mm. So I think this gives a, a, I mean, at least how I saw it, I was like, wow, you know, these are sort of things that um, they start to tick boxes. I was like, wow, that's amazing that you could, let's say, buy an artwork from, I don't even have to be in that country, but I can support an artist who's based in Europe or, you know, Asia or, or South mm. America or Africa or wherever. So I think that's what struck me. And also, the last thing I feel was, and it's two things actually, it's still very much out there, you know? Like as in, there's still things to be developed. Like one interest, one thing I've sort of like obviously asked a lot of people about was um, the file issue, the IPF, when you buy a token, like where's the mm. file, where's located? And why, why I'm mentioning that is to me, I feel um, what's encouraging me at least in this space or how I, I'm seeing, okay, fine, it's starting to make sense. Because I'll be honest, way, way before, um, I think you really had to be a complete, I mean, you had to be so into it to understand it, you know? But if you're coming a bit from the outside, mm. um, the thing of like, the tech, I feel like the technology side of it isn't quite up to date with the idea itself. So what I mean by it is like, so like, let's say these file issues that are currently in the space, like being discussed, like, I think what, as that advances, um, and as well as other things, like how you just, I think for me, a key thing is like the display of the digital art, like how you're going to showcase it. Um, so the, the, just in a nutshell, those technology, like those advancements, that's going to be to me, what kind of reassured me that there's movement in the space. And then I think the last mm -hmm. one is like kind of obviously having um, connected with people like you and, um, seeing the movement, like there's, there's a momentum, there's a natural momentum. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not like stagnant, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's great to have like these conversations. And that's why it's like, I also, I thought it was encouraging for other people as well to maybe hear from you about it, because I think as a community, you, you kind of push each other, if that makes sense, or you reassure each other. So sometimes you're like, how, how does this make sense or whatever? But, um, when you're seeing other people in the space and you're seeing, um, things moving forward, I find that's what kind of gave me um, a lot of encouragement in, in what this segment is. So like, yeah, just to round it off, I find it's like, it's the advantage of an art from being purely digital. So you have no physical limitations. So you can buy art, you won't have an issue of storage, you won't have the, I mean, from even let's say the estate planning for collectors like who, who would know, you know, more established collectors, like in terms of estate planning, financial, legal, all that stuff. It's even very, it's very strategic. It, uh, mm. You won't have many headaches. Um, and also the art form itself. Do you know one thing like, and I think artists who, who do it well, like they would understand that the beauty of what digital art offers, like you can play a lot with different things that you can't do a traditional art. And I think that's mm. what's like really differentiating it as its own category. Like people are going to start collecting and buying stuff, which is different. So like, I, I can just envision the future, like you're going to have maybe a house or whatever. And digital offerings actually, which are now being set up, I know in people's places, you know, um, having discussions with mm. like companies. So you're gonna have that, and you're gonna have art that from one frame, you can see, you know, many different types of art, your collections, moving art. So I think that to me is like pretty cool. Like, obviously, I'm not going to say it's going to replace traditional art, but it will complement it a lot. And it has those type of benefits so that it's, you can host many different collections. You can trade it on the secondary market, buy and sell, and you can support artists um, quite easily. So that, I, I think another thing that like, obviously, like you came from um, the traditional space down to well, filmmaking, but I've talked to the other artists as well, and like they, it's like it complements their work. It doesn't necessarily have to replace it. So I think it's like a good mm. complement to the industry. At least that's how I've kind of been processing it. Um, so I, yeah, that's what brought me to it. And obviously, um, connecting with uh, different companies, people in the space, it kind of expanded my my interest and intrigue, and also the way we're doing different stuff now. So. Like we're now collaborating on this collection and and, uh, and uh, sharing it out, sharing the ideas, the concepts, and also, as I mentioned, the advantages of, of potentially collecting in this art form, in this sort of art category. So yeah, that's how mm -hmm. I 
I mean, I don't know if you resonate with that or if there's anything kind of different that you see. No, a lot. A, a, a lot, and because, uh, for example, uh, just to still maybe elaborate a little bit on the previous question that you asked me yeah. of what's next, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it this way, uh, because you're aware of a couple of things that I don't yet want to share publicly, because, I, you know, a part of this is 4D chess of how to do this career properly, and then, but the, some of the origin reasons of why I came into this space to begin with was that I started listening to Andreas Antonopoulos, who is one of the punchiest speakers I've ever listened to in my life. And one of the things in, in his concept was that there was uh, there are 3.5 billion people in the world without access to a bank account. And it is because the legacy banking system needs for you to have an address. Yeah. And many people don't have that. Therefore, they can't access the global economy at all. And where that leads to uh, and for example, led to in the early, early crypto art, um, the, the Carlos Marcial, for example, who's a, one of the early crypto artists, he managed to, as a, a, a father of young kids without, you know, in Mexico, he, w he didn't have much of a sort of a future ahead of him as, a, as an artist, but he got into crypto art early and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm not sure if he's a millionaire, uh, he might be many times over, I don't, I don't know. But at the very least, he was doing all of a sudden very, very well for a Mexican artist. So essentially, uh, 3.5 billion people, because even in, in remote places in Africa, uh, you'll have mobile phones or you'll have a laptop, maybe a village or something like that. And all of a sudden, if you do your creativity in a certain kind of way and you kind of follow this thing, all of a sudden you have not only have access to a bank account, you essentially have a bank on your phone and you have access to a global marketplace through your creativity, which would have otherwise eluded you completely. Because now, uh, it, despite you uploading something in a remote I don't know, uh, village in India, you might end up in front of a collector in New York. And th those kinds of things, like culturally, the whole theme of monetary empowerment uh, at, at this scale is an Im important and aspirational, uh, inspiring topic. But then you have the, the ethics of it that is a, a moldable playground for, for an artist to come up with something interesting from. And where it will ultimately head... And this is something that I realized around 2017 and 16, around the same time as I, I was getting into this, uh, is that soon the user interface will be different from our mobile phones. It will be something like Neuralink and, and those different kinds of things. And that means that you will be going to live inside of artworks that on, not only interact with you but know who you are personally and will cater to you possibly custom experiences you know, to a similar degree that an ayahuasca trip does. Uh, art will evolve to be a companion of ours, again, in a very different kind of way of what it's been the last few decades. And this is part of the counterintuitive, and for me, very intuitive movement of art, of why I wanted to look at art from the origins of cave paintings, from a religious side, from the power of storytelling to this representation of the eternal, is that it will be a psychological and spiritual tool with our evolution with ChatGPT into something that is a profoundly relevant gro personal growth tool and a, a method of keeping the awe in the picture in a similar kind of way as we're, we're used to only feeling like we had as children. I think this is where it's headed. And, and we are doing these brick by brick installments of of how to get there. And this is why, you know, VESA Digital and my kind of way of looking at the Renaissance 360 and this, um, this evolution of where we're going, this is, that's the motion that I want to be a part of, to, to see the big picture, know that I can't get there immediately, and nor will I ever see the end of it, but be one of the people who carries the torch to that destination. And I think if I do my job well, then then I've probably done a good job of giving a value argument as to why my art hopefully has has and will have value even after I'm gone. No, that's fantastic. And especially I, I just when you're saying that, like I think the key is obviously the authenticity of the, the artist, um, the story, and how that transcends into your artworks. Because I'm sure like that can be easily swayed or, you know, sort of, I wouldn't say corrupted, but let's say swayed. Um, so that's, yeah, definitely I, I resonate with what you're saying with respect to that. Um, 
in terms of the artwork, obviously, like, I think we've covered so much. <laughs> and, um, but there's still so much one can discuss. But to round it off, I mean, to me, we, what are the, if, I mean, obviously people who are interested, they can visit um, our website or they can touch, you know, check you guys out, check, sort of check your website out. Um, what would you advise people who want to maybe start to buy some of your artwork? Like, where should they look? Like, would you just recommend crypto art, artisan series, abstract? Um, which ones should they take a look at, do you think? Um, it's it sort of like this is why I like to have I'm, I'm very one to one I, I want to have conversations with my collectors and, and kind of have a personal touch to it because it's impossible to say in general because there's so many things that I've done it's easy to offer once I know a little bit of what might be of interest because for example there's a big big difference between uh, my early work in the body painting art as opposed to what I've been doing in crypto art or what I'm wanting to do with the renaissance 360 thing so uh, i'd be much better able to to recommend if i knew a little bit of a wind of where where something might be inspiring but all of it is there i i think the only advice that i can never feel comfortable giving anyone uh, and this is something that was asked of me uh, a while ago also to aspiring artists uh, do, do you have any advice for them and i i think the it's just courage I've found that courage is the key to life. Uh, all of us are in a variety of varying degrees of fear all the time. And the, the spice of it all and what makes this worth it is for us to do the hero's journey and find, our, find a way for us to get over ourselves. And, and if there's something that your gut tells you, your intuition tells you, uh, but your mind is giving you all sorts of different kinds of scenarios of how that might might be scary of, or risky or something like that. Um, courage and a gut feeling is is good are good things to listen to, and we we keep failing time and time again to listen to it to learn the lesson, uh, usually painfully. That it's a it's a good idea to listen to intuition when you have it. Yeah. I think that's a good note to sort of round it off on. Obviously, I could go on for hours. You know, we can have these. <laughs> No, just in general, um, you know, I'm happy to talk to people. Uh, and if there's something that resonates, get in touch with yourself or, or me directly. And, and that's it, really. I had a great time talking with you, Roll, and I hope we'll have many more conversations. And and the the aspiration is the same. We want to have ourselves be successful as well as this whole space, and we're we're a part of something exciting. And and it's it's a cool train to be on. <laughs> For sure. All right, man. Have a great evening. Cheers.